In this lecture video, I'm going to be talking about state within the context of HTTP. So these web applications that are living out on the World Wide Web do not have to just be simple, static, cat-serving uh, web applications that can just serve you images of cats, right? These web applications instead can be much more sophisticated, and many of the web applications I'm sure you use all, all the time on a daily basis are much more sophisticated. And they aren't just these static resource serving uh, machines. Instead, what they really are these days are remote programs. It's a program sitting on some remote server, so not sitting on your own system, on a remote system. And what your browser is doing is it is interacting with that remote server, speaking HTTP as we've discussed in this series. And it's talking with this program. Now, interesting programs often have this concept of state. So the thing that's differentiating, let's say, a program that allows you to log into it and view some details about your account, maybe do some online banking, is state. Um, that is the differentiating thing between that and a program which just constantly serves a cat image is that you can interact with this remote program and the state of the program evolves with time. It gets more interesting, it can store data, it can keep that data persistently, it can push that data out to other people. There's this notion of state. But there's an issue with state within the web, which is that HTTP, actually, if we look back at RFC 1945, you might have missed it when I mentioned it, it is a stateless protocol. So this is an issue for us because how are we supposed to maintain a concept of state when our protocol is stateless? So we saw in a previous lecture that we could, for instance, post to some greet resource with a name and that updates the name. So when we're doing that, that isn't the protocol that's being stateful. That is the web application itself being stateful. And we're just replacing some value within the web application. So clearly that can work. So what do I mean when I say that the protocol is stateless? Clearly a web application can still be stateful, but the protocol is stateless. And what I mean by that is let's say we have some program that we can log into. So we have this login resource and we're gonna to post to this login resource at account.example.com and we're going to form URL encode this data as we've seen in the URL and encoding lecture. Uh, we're going to encode that, hey, I've got my username, Connor, and I've got my password, password. And I want to log into this remote web application, this remote program. And I want this web server to understand now that I've been logged in. The issue is that this request, we can get a reply, sure, but any future request no longer understands the fact that I'm logged in because the protocol itself is stateless. So we could, for example, on this server say, hey, someone logged in and keep track of that. And then we could have some other resource that says, yeah, this person has logged in before. But there's no way for this web server now to know that it was my client that logged in and any future requests that I want you to facilitate, I want you to understand that I am the person that logged in. I need you to keep track of that. The protocol keeping track of the client somehow for future requests, it just isn't a part of HTTP. It's not one of the features of the protocol. The protocol is a stateless protocol. So what do we do? And this is an issue, right? So in this case, we say, hey, we're returning 501 not implemented because I mean, what do you want me to do about the fact that you're logged in? If you make a future request, I have no idea that you're logged in because I don't know who the client is. There's a solution to this problem. And the solution is HTTP cookies. So we're going to use HTTP headers for maintaining state. And the way that that works is that the server sets a cookie in a response with the header set cookie. And now the client includes that cookie in all future requests with the header cookie. So now because our client is constantly sending future requests um, to the server and it's up to the client to know to 
basically respond to this cookie protocol in some sense on top of HTTP that, hey, the server says set a cookie, I need you to always now send me requests with the header cookie with that value. The server can now use the cookie provided in those future requests. So what does that look like? So let's say we go back to our example of logging in. So we're posting to the login request or to the login resource rather at account.example.com. And we're posting again our username equals Connor and our password equals password. And we can see here in this example that if we kind of pretend we've got, let's say, some database on our remote server with this uh, web application. And our database has a user with a username Connor and a password password, a user Kanak with a password leet password, admin with a leet secret password. Um, so this, in this context of this uh, hypothetical web application, we're, we're providing correct credentials for logging in. So what the server can do is it can say, okay, I understand you logged in. Um, and it can say, in this case, this is kind of the standard response. So we saw in a previous lecture about uh, status codes. In this case, it's saying, okay, 302, I've moved temporarily, which is basically saying, okay, I see your request. And if you want to continue, and I want you to continue, you like make another request, make another request at account.example.com. And when you make that request, use the cookie oft equals Connor. So I need you to make all future requests with the cookie header saying oft equals Connor. So the browser following this uh, cookie protocol, it understands how cookies behave. Of course, uh, arbitrary actor might not follow this, um, but this is well defined and we should follow this and that's what we're going to do. We're going to say, okay, the server said set a cookie, future requests, I'm going to include my cookie. It's said to set oft equal to Connor in future requests, so that's what I'm doing. So now I make another request to the root resource and with this slash, of course, and we say that our cookie is oft equals Connor and now we have a concept of state. The server has something to go off of now. It can say, okay, I have state embedded within this cookie and I can facilitate this request. And I understand, okay, you have been off as Connor. And now when you make this request, I can say, okay, you know what? Hello, Connor. You have successfully logged in. Uh, I know who you are. Uh, your cookie tells me the state of this connection. I didn't have to keep track of the client in some way, which the protocol does not allow for, but the the cookie headers allow us to keep track of stateful information. So I'm able to respond, hey, hello, Connor. And again, um, someone could log in additionally, so we can make, an, let's say, another login request um, to the login resource, with this time the username equals Kanak and the password equals password. Um, and in this case, we are going to get a set cookie off equals Kanak. Uh, we've been moved temporarily, go back to the root resource. Uh, we say off equals Kanak. And again, even though we have two separate uh, requests and they're both making a request to this root resource, the state is being maintained. And when Connor logged in, Connor got the root resource that said, hello, Connor. And when Kanak logged in, they got the uh, root resource that says hello Kanak, and we are maintaining this state through cookies. So the thing though to realize here is that this is all just within the protocol. So we, if you think right how we've been making these requests, we've just been including along a cookie that says oft equals Connor, and it's up to the web application to determine what it's going to do with that. So in this case, we can just bypass that, right? This is something to realize um, for a security purpose, right? Is that these web servers are ultimately just speaking HTTP. These requests don't have to be generated by our browser. We can create our own requests. And what happens if we never even try to log in? What if we just declare that our cookie is oft equals admin. We never made a login request. We just declare some state because we understand how this web server uh, works. Well, when we do that, we just get hello admin because again, this protocol is stateless. It's not keeping track of the fact 
that um, we made a login request, all it's doing is providing this cookie saying, okay, auth equals whatever your username is, and it's just using that to track your state. Um, we never actually had to go through and do that login request because again, this, this protocol is stateless. It's just using cookies. Um, I could make auth equal to whatever, and it's really up to the, the web application's logic on what it's gonna do with that. So clearly there's a little bit of a security concern, which will be explored in future lectures, um, and why it's important to understand how this protocol works and how web applications speak this protocol. Because um, whereas normally you could not just directly manipulate headers within your browser, right? Your, your browser would never make this arbitrary cookied request. Ultimately, that web server is just speaking HTTP. And we don't have to speak to uh, it by proxy of our browser. We don't need to have our browser be generating all of our HTTP requests. We could generate our own HTTP requests, and that's all that the server is speaking. Our web browser is really just a translator for clicks and actions on a page into HTTP. And really, all that server is speaking is HTTP. It's not speaking like browser clicks, it's speaking HTTP. And that is what enables us if we write our own uh, raw request of HTTP to this server to start doing actions that maybe the web application developer hadn't anticipated because they never wrote their web application with this concept in mind that someone wouldn't have logged in, that it was this stateless protocol. Uh, so that's something to kind of keep in mind. It's something that will be explored in future modules. Now there is a solution to this. Um, and this is kind of the, the structure of a lot of cookies. Um, and that is instead when we go to login, is to maintain another database, another layer of information for when we log in. So before we just had a bunch of usernames and passwords just kind of statically stored there. But in this case, when we go and create a login request on this other web application that's implemented, I guess, in a different way, we could say, with our username of Connor and password equals password. Um, what it might say instead is not that auth equals Connor, but it might just keep track of a session ID. And that session ID could just be some, uh, we'll say difficult to guess for now, and we'll discuss kind of properties of cookies from like kind of a cryptographic perspective in future modules. Um, but in this case, we'll just say this is this difficult to guess thing that, you know, maybe a malicious actor wouldn't stumble onto. Um, with a session ID equal to this value. And then when we make a future request to the root resource, what that web application can do is it can just use um, this session ID and it's kept track of in its other database that, hey, we generated a session for a new user. So a new user just logged in, that we're gonna assign them this session ID. And we're going to say that they are the Connor user logged in and we can maintain the state and do future things with that. And what that allows us to do, again, is when we pass along now the session ID, we can say that, hey, we've been authorized as the Connor user. So this is kind of two, um, fundamentally, they're the same thing, right? All we're doing is we're using cookies, but it's up to the web application to decide how it wants to use cookies for maintaining state. So there might be valid reasons to just put the raw state into the cookie to just say, hey, auth equals Connor is fine. That from our security model of this web application, we don't have an issue with that. So for instance, you could imagine some web application where um, let's say there's different themes for viewing the page, right? Maybe we'll have a, a light mode and a dark mode. And we wanna store that in the cookie because when we make future requests to that web application, we're gonna be returning different responses based on whether or not the page should be rendered in light mode or dark mode. Um, we could put that in a cookie and just say like theme equals dark, for example. And there's not really an issue with that. There's no security concern. If someone was to hypothetically forge their own HTTP request with a different theme, we don't care. But maybe there's other things where, for example, logging into a web application, we do care because we don't want someone to just be able to declare themselves the admin user and um, just start acting as the admin user. This is kind of why it's really important 
to understand the HTTP protocol. It's because as you begin to understand the HTTP protocol, a lot of the common security concerns within web applications just naturally arise as a result of the limitations of the protocol. Not even limitations, the, the standard format of the protocol, of how the protocol says it is meant to be used. It says it is a stateless protocol, and if you are um, not thinking about this as a web developer, uh, creating your web application, and you just assume, um, of course, all users are going to log in and only set this auth equal to my username value because my server told you to do that. Um, if you're not thinking like, well, hey, um, I can set auth equal to whatever because this is the, the boundary. This is basically all we have is this client talking to the server and what they're talking is HTTP and I can create whatever sort of HTTP message I want to send to this server. If you're not considering that carefully, this is how a lot of security issues can arise. It's very important to understand the specific details of this protocol and keep them in mind while writing your web application.